for this podcast and the following message come from State Farm, offering insurance protection for when things go wrong, as well as products and services for life's possibilities. Agent information is at statefarm.com. State Farm, here to help life go right. From WHYY in Philadelphia, I'm Terry Gross with Fresh Air. Today, Mary Gatesgill, who first became known for her short stories about people whose relationships were considered transgressive, will talk about her new collection of reviews and personal essays on subjects like date rape, working as a stripper when she was just starting out on her own, and running away from home. I ran away from home the first time at 15. And if I was a parent, I would definitely not want my 15-year-old daughter running away out in the world. I mean, nobody would. Also, we hear from Julia Tertian. She'll talk about her new cookbook, Small Victories. It's for people who are insecure about their cooking. I think of recipes as they're kind of sold to people as prescriptions, like Mm. these really uh, precise things, but there's so much more flexibility in cooking. There's very rarely like a wrong answer. That's coming up on Fresh Air. Thanks for listening to Fresh Air. I want to let you know about a new morning news podcast from NPR called Up First. Its purpose is to give you a sense of the big stories and issues of the day and to do it in just 10 minutes. You can hear it weekday mornings by 6 a.m. Eastern on the NPR One app and wherever you get your podcasts. My guest Mary Gateskill first became known for her 1988 collection of short stories, Bad Behavior, about people whose relationships and sexual relationships were outside of what was defined as normal. One of those stories was adapted into the movie Secretary with Maggie Gyllenhaal and James Spader. In Gateskill's new collection of essays, dating from 1994 to 2016, Gateskill writes, In case you don't know, I'm supposedly sick and dark. But as Soraya Dorbin recently wrote in the L.A. Review of Books, it should be obvious that she is neither one nor the other, that she is, in fact, a voice of reason and sanity, of piercing intelligence and generous humanity. Gayscale's 2005 novel, Veronica, was on our book critic Maureen Corrigan's list of her favorite books of that year and was nominated for a National Book Award. Maureen described Gatesgill's 2015 novel, The Mare, as a raw, beautiful story about love and mutual delusion. I spoke with Gatesgill about her new collection, Somebody with a Little Hammer. In one of her essays, she writes about working as a stripper when she was just starting out on her own. Mary Gatesgill, welcome back to Fresh Air. You write that you were a PC feminist before PC (laughs) was even named. Um, So what was it like for you as a feminist to be stripping and to have so many men lustfully gazing at you? Did you find it to be like affirming, an ego booster? Was it threatening? Was it demeaning? Did it make you feel more valuable or less valuable? You know what I mean? Like, what, how, I know you were doing it because you needed to make a living, but when you were on stage or whatever, like, what, what was it like for you? Well, I, uh, that that was kind of you know, was a stage the then. wrong word <laughs> no it was actually a stage okay good um but where where the places that i was working were actually old school strip clubs they were not um i i did work sometimes in bars but the main places i worked were actually a kind of a cross between um like they did there was one place that actually had a band still it's like a burlesque um, era. <laughs> You're just it, well, it was yeah. it, it was transitioning from the burlesque era to the topless go-go bar era. Uh-huh. Like there were women who still like had boas and um, did a very old school strip act. It was not uh, you, you like customers weren't allowed to touch you. There wasn't there's was very little tipping. They couldn't touch you. They couldn't like stick money in your underpants or anything like that. But but it, I was very young. I was like 21, and um, I, I wouldn't say at that point I was a, a PC feminist, but I was kind of getting there. I was thinking about things in a different way. But at that time, I mean, it perhaps sounds strange to you, but it, I know it wouldn't sound strange to other to some people now. Uh, I didn't see a contradiction. Um, to me, I, I felt like this was something that I could do for my own benefit, and I didn't feel like it was degrading, although I, I, I could see how it could become that way. I, I saw the women who'd been doing it for a really long time, and it, they, it did define them. I could see if you did this for a very long time, it could define you regardless of what you thought your politics were or what you thought you were 
in control of, and I was cautious about that. But for me to do it for, I did it for two years, didn't feel um, like there was any conflict. But by the way, I didn't call myself a feminist with a capital F. I didn't like walk around saying feminist, giving feminist speeches or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I was just very empathic with, say, people like Jermaine Greer particularly, who were speaking out about women like being treated better and being paid equally and not... uh, like at that time, in the, in the 70s, you could actually – it was almost impossible to successfully prosecute a rape charge. In some states, you actually had to have a witness. Uh, a, a woman could be beaten black and blue, and still the rapist could get off. It's, it, that's pretty extraordinary. And I was aware of that. And I, that's, when, that's what feminism meant to me, like dealing with that kind of gross inequity. And so – to me, the idea of, of getting paid money to, to take off my clothes, it just wasn't horrific to me. But, you know, that that's a, a whole – there's several branches of feminism, some who really would violently disagree with that and some who wouldn't. But I didn't even know about that then. Once you developed um, a persona or whatever, what was your act? Well, I didn't really have a fully developed act, but I looked very, very young. At 21, I – I had a more developed body, but if I had not had that, I could have been 12 years old. So I would dance to very young music like the Supremes or the Jackson 5, early Beatles, um, stuff like that. Was there an aspect of it that was a little creepy, thinking that a lot of the older men were getting off on the idea of seeing a girl as opposed to a woman? No. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I I think that I... (laughs) I understood that a lot of men have that desire. I mean, it certainly learned that. And even now, I don't find the fantasy itself creepy. I I, I think it's pretty standard. I think it's creepy or beyond creepy when it's acted out on. So you ran away from home when you were 16. And in your 2005 novel, Veronica, she says, I ran away from home partly because I was unhappy there and partly because it was what people did then. It was part of the new style. Did you see it that way at the time for yourself? And did you know people who'd who'd run away or read about them? Well, everybody heard about it or read about it because so many people were doing it. But that isn't why I ran away. The the girl in Veronica is very, very different from me. Um, Her situation is not at all the same. She does run away partly out of a kind of boredom um, and a wish for something more vital in life, which I I don't disparage, but that is not why I ran away. I ran away because my parents wanted to institutionalize me, and I understandably didn't want that. I would never have done it otherwise because I really cared about my parents and I didn't want to hurt them or scare them. But but no, I, I did it because I felt that I was in danger. Why did your parents want to institutionalize you? That's kind of a complicated situation, I, I basically because they were pretty conservative, and I was um, I, I I seemed to change dramatically in their mind. I went from being an extremely quiet um, kid who did well in school and pretty much abided by rules to s- suddenly um, smoking pot and um, that was, just a little bit, really, but that's that seemed very scary to them, and getting kicked out of school, and not even really having sex, but appearing like I might, and that was scary to them. And also in a in a psychiatric setting, I failed something that used. To, I don't think this is used anymore, but it was something called a Rorschach test, an inkblot test, mm-hmm. and I also would add that the um, psychiatrist who ran this place was a guy who was on record saying that any teenager who smoked marijuana was mentally ill. Wow. So that that kind of... That kind of sealed the deal, huh? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I look back to some of the things I did when I was a teenager, that really upset my parents, and I thought, like, you just don't understand me. You don't want me to have any freedom at all, do you? Um, and and I look back on it now, and I think like, oh, oh of course they were scared. <laughs> they, had every, they had every reason to be scared. <laughs> Do you ever look yeah. back on your past that way and think the same thing? Well, I certainly uh, wouldn't want I, that. That happened when I was fifteen, by the way. Uh, that, that that I ran away from home the first time at fifteen. Mm-hmm. And if if I was a parent, I would definitely not want my fifteen-year-old daughter 
running away uh, out in the world, especially, I mean, nobody would. Nobody would. Where did reading a lot and writing come in? Well, I read a lot from, from the beginning as a child. I loved reading. My my mother read to us even before we learned how to read, and I it was just something I took to very, very naturally and would read adult books sometimes, too, as, you know, when I was a kid. And um, I did just I, I loved it, and it was also very natural for me to um, write very early. Like when the first thing I did when I was six when I learned how to write was... Um, write a story. When you were six? Mm-hmm. You still have it? You know, I don't know if I do, but uh, my mother might have it. But, I mean, it was extremely simple. It was called Billy and Betty Blue Jay, and they meet, and they fall in love and fly off together. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you're just joining us, my guest is Mary Gateskill. She has a new collection of essays called Somebody with a Little Hammer. Let's take a short break here, and then we'll talk some more. This is Fresh Air. We'd like to say a quick thank you and share a message from one of our sponsors, AT&T's Audience Network, and their new original series, Fearless with Tim Ferriss. Ferriss is an author, entrepreneur, and podcaster who spends his life asking questions and scouring the globe for answers. Now, he's sitting down with renowned performers to dissect strategies to succeed. Premieres May 30th on Audience. Watch Fearless with Tim Ferriss on Direct TV, UVerse, or stream on Direct TV now. In a couple of essays collected in this book, you write about being raped, and the first time is you considered it kind of a date rape, even though it wasn't exactly a date. And he had offered you LSD, which you took, and then you really kind of lost your bearings and um, and ended up having sex with him. You, you think you probably wouldn't have, and it was not a good experience for you, and you felt it was somewhat coercive. Um, and then about a year later, you were violently raped by somebody who threatened to kill you. And you say something really surprising uh, in writing about that. You write, after it was over, it actually affected me less than many other mundane instances of emotional brutality I've suffered or seen other people suffer. Frankly, I've been scarred more by experiences I had on the playground in elementary school. But then, later on, and you write about this in a later essay, you realized that it had a much deeper impact on you than you thought. And Go ahead. Uh, I still would stand by that, actually, even though... Stand stand by that it didn't scar you in the the way that people say it scarred them. Not in the same way. Um, it's not. I'm not saying it had no effect on me. It, it just seemed felt, to me reading. It took a while for you to realize what the impact really was. Yeah, but even when I wrote that first statement that you referred to about the playground, it, it had been years later, um, and I, it, I, I didn't mean to say that it had no impact. Um, it certainly did. I mean, I remember very vividly when I was at an eye doctor's office. Shortly after it happened, he made a move that surprised me, and I, pra- I, I practically leapt out of the room. So I was very aware that it had an impact on me, and I think perhaps more of one than I knew. But nonetheless, I have I would say I have been scarred more emotionally by things. When you're a child, things that don't seem that bad to an adult can seem really terrible because you're formative, you're forming. And I think what I, my point was that emotional cruelty can be far more more devastating and more difficult because the man who raped me was a stranger. He was not someone I trusted. He was not someone I had any expectation of in terms of kindness or decency. But when people who you know or, or who you at least are meeting in a context of friendship who might be your peers um, do something that deeply wounds you emotionally, for one thing, it's very hard to understand what happened. It's it's. I think the phrase I used in the article was "it sticks to you" because you don't know how responsible you were. You don't you don't know how big a part you played. If somebody simply attacks you, whether it's to rape you or beat you or whatever, you, there's no question that they did something wrong. Whereas if something happens in a more complex emotional way, or somebody just pouncing on you in the playground, that that's far more inexplicable and and 
in a strange way, uh, to me, worse because it's hard, for me it's harder to understand and to separate out what did I have to do with this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that it wasn't it wasn't about you personally. It wasn't about somebody's feelings about you. They weren't judging you. They were just violently attacking you. But it, yeah, was, it wasn't personal. It's still terrifying, yes, it, <laughs> you know. Well, yeah. It, Yes, it, it was, and I think it affected me on a nervous system level in a way that I didn't get. I think that the worst thing about that kind of attack is that even if you don't, it may not impact you that much emotionally for the reasons I said. It's just, to me, so clear that they did something wrong, um, as opposed to something, another situation where you're not sure if it was your fault or not. But what's really bad about a physical assault like that, and this is something I didn't understand, I think it can leave a kind of physical effect on you in a nervous system way where um, you can suddenly become really scared in in a situation that isn't actually harmful. And it it isn't rational. You don't know why you're feeling scared, but it's because of that. It's triggering a a, a subliminal memory of some kind. Yeah, it sounds like with, with with one man who you were playing around with, you know, uh, and you say you're both fully clothed and everything, but you had this like PTSD experience. You know, a flashback yeah. experience, and it just kind of set you off. And, uh, you know, I I guess I wasn't surprised to read that. Yeah, it, it was that, and I didn't even know what it was. Mm-hmm. I it didn't even, I, I had no idea what to make the connection. One of your essays in your new collection, Somebody with a Little Hammer, is about losing a cat and mm-hmm. desperately trying to find it in every way imaginable. And also, in a way, losing two children. And these are two children who you um, who spent, a, what, a couple of weeks a year with you through the Fresh Air Fund program, which is a program to send inner-city kids to the country uh, for the summer, for a couple of weeks in the summer, or to send them to a home that is in, I guess, a more you know rural kind of um, setting so that they can be exposed to that and, and, and get away. And, you know, you write about how you'd considered having a baby and considered adopting and kind of went in this direction instead. Can you talk about the decision not to have a child and how you weighed both sides of that in your mind? Well, it it, it was a decision. If it was a decision at all, I made very early, and I didn't really weigh it much. The only time, it was just very instinctive that I didn't want to. The only time that I considered it was when I got married, and I was still young enough that I probably could have. And I did think about it. There was a couple things going on that I we didn't have enough money. Both of us were, at least I was in quite a bit of debt, and I had to work teaching, and I was trying to write a book, and I thought if 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 we had a child, I, he would have to take care of the child all the time, and I would have to teach all the time, and I wouldn't write at all. And I also began to think, well, I'm also kind of old to have a child. A baby is very energetic, and maybe it would be better to adopt an older child, like a seven-year-old or something. So that's what led us to the Fresh Air Fund, and we actually got way more involved with those children than just having them up for a couple weeks. Um, we were would have them up several times a year, and including Christmas, and also go visit them in the city. And um, I sent the boy to Catholic school, and the girl too, but she got kicked out pretty fast. I mean, and we're still I, we still know them. Um, I, in Lost Cat, I was I was afraid of losing them, and I felt like I was. They were becoming teenagers. I, I met him when he was six, and her when she was ten, and they were t- becoming teenagers. And and I was feeling like frustrated by the my lack of ability to really understand what they were going through anymore. And so I was I had fear, a great fear of losing them, and. Um, it's certainly not as close a relationship as it was, but but I, we do still know them. In your most recent book, The Mayor, one of the main characters is uh, you know a woman who, like you did, um, has this relationship she builds with a couple of children through you know a program like the Fresh Air Fund, 
And um, this book is written from the perspective of several of the characters. So the perspective keeps shifting. And one of the children at one point thinks like, you know, I'm stuck with nice people who don't have anything to do with me. Were you trying to imagine what it was like for the two children who came and stayed with you? What it was like for them to be with you and how they saw you? Um, actually, the mirror wasn't about two children, and the mirror is just there's a <clears throat> they're just involved with a girl. She does have a brother, but he doesn't ever come up there and spend any time there. Um, it, it was highly fictionalized, uh, but yeah, I mean, I I actually don't think that they had that particular thought. But I was I wasn't trying to base the character exactly on them. I was I was just trying to think of how a child might feel in that situation, and I, I would imagine it's pretty strange for a, certainly for a six year old. I mean, in the real life story, the the boy um, who we met first was only six years old. I mean, that's that's really I can only imagine frightening for a six year old to be put on a bus and go stay with a bunch of people that he doesn't know, and whether they're nice or not, it's like um, why do I want to be here? Not to mention that they're white as sheets, and they've got they've got more than anything you've ever had. Um, but um, in the case of uh, Velvet, she's older. I mean, the character Velvet, she's older. But I, I could imagine somebody thinking that, like, yeah, they're nice, but what what do they have to do with me, and why am I here? My guest is Mary Gateskill. Her new collection of essays is called "Somebody with a Little Hammer." We'll talk more after a short break, and we'll hear from Julia Tertian, whose new cookbook is for people who find cooking stressful. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Madison Reed, revolutionizing the way women color their hair. Gorgeous, salon-quality, multidimensional hair color made from ingredients you can feel good about with no harsh odor. Hundreds of thousands of women have discovered this new way to color hair, delivered to your door on your schedule. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. Madison Reed would like to honor Fresh Air listeners with 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit with promo code FRESHAIR. Let's get back to my interview with Mary Gateskill. When we left off, we were talking about her 2015 novel, The Mare, which is about a couple and the Dominican child who lives with them for a few weeks each year through the Fresh Air Fund, a fund that provides children from low-income communities the opportunity to spend time in the country with host families. Gateskill and her husband have had a long-term relationship with two children who they hosted through the Fresh Air Fund. Those children are now young adults. Did they read the book, uh, your novel, The Mayor? Well, I don't know. Um, I, I gave it to um, them. I, I, I saw that I met them for Thanksgiving after it came out, and um, I handed it to them, and I, I said, I think you might find this really weird, and you might find it boring, actually, because it's pretty slow-paced. And she looked at it, she opened it, read the first page and a half, looked at me very seriously and said, this isn't boring, Mary. And then closed it and said, I think I'm going to read it later. And I didn't hear from her for quite a while. So I texted her and asked her how she was, and she said, okay. And I said, did you read the book? Because I thought she might have been angry or something. I wouldn't, I don't know why she would be, but people can react, you know, all kinds of ways. And she said she started to, and she had too many feelings. And so she stopped. And I understood that. Because I actually I said that to her when I first gave it to her. I think you might have a lot of feelings. Um, I hope she reads it eventually, and I'd like to talk about it with her. Um, it's, it's not really about her, like I said, but, I mean, the girl in the story is pretty different from her, and the things that happen in the story are quite different. I wrote it partly for her, though, because she was somebody who... Um, really loved uplifting movies and stories. And I, I, it's interesting, because as a writer, I've never been somebody who believed that you should had any obligation to write uplifting movies and stories, storylines for people to make people feel good. It just, 
I was just never about that. Not that I wanted people to feel bad either, but I just thought writing with that kind of agenda was a mistake. But it's really different when you're writing for young people, and I, I could really feel her. Like if we watched a movie together, um, which was a, a lot, um, I could feel her really respond if there was a Latina character on the screen. And I, there, that didn't happen often enough. And it's not something normally I was very tuned into, but I became very tuned into it. And I remember during like, 2007, when I was still pretty involved with them, I saw a little film clip of National Velvet, and I thought, oh, I wish there could be a movie like this about a Latina girl, but I can't write a movie. And I tried to sell it to my agent as a treatment, thinking somebody else could write it as a movie. And he said, oh, if you want to do this, you've got to write a young adult novel. And I thought, well, that's impossible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really, I just thought, that that's impossible. And especially, how can I write from the point of view of a Latina girl? It's ridiculous. I can't do that. Plus, I know nothing about horses. But I couldn't let go of the idea. It kept coming back to me in a way that I've just never experienced before. Like, lines of dialogue would pop into my head. Um, scenes would I'd be sitting at an airport being angry because I'd missed my flight or the flight was delayed or something. And a whole scene would unscroll from this story that I hadn't even committed to writing. I, I was still thinking, I can't write this. So that's really never happened to me before, and I finally decided to do it. You, you've said that after your first collection of short stories, Bad Behavior, was published, that people expected you to embody hipness, <laughs> but, but that you didn't. And people expected that in part because, you know, these are like transgressive stories, and there were stories about people who had, you know, what would be considered kind of kinky relationships, BDS and M. Um, so uh, what's the image of you now, do you think? What do people expect to meet when they meet you? I really don't know. But it, it it's interesting because, and you're talking about that, I do know, like, um, the, the review I got of um, the book of essays in the Times, which was a very a very nice review, but it was written by uh, the same guy, Dwight Garner, who reviewed The Mare and was plainly disappointed that it was, he thought it was too mainstream and nice and it wasn't transgressive enough. Whereas he was happy to report that with somebody with a little hammer was every bit as transgressive as I ever was. And I, I just don't use that word in connection with myself. I, I'm not trying to transgress anything. And I also don't see um, a contradiction between um, the mare, which it, to me that it's as realistic as, as a story in one of the later stories that I've written, um, it, it's very much along the, it, about the same theme. It's about un, unsocially um, sanctioned love, love that's not socially sanctioned. It, in, say, Bad Behavior, which, by the way, strikes me as a very naive book from my point of view now, but anyway, like, say, if you're writing from the point of view of um, a BDSM relationship or, or uh, John who's fallen in love with a prostitute, those, are, you might say, are socially unsanctioned loves, and the love that Ginger feels for Velvet is also socially unsanctioned. So I think that there, the, the theme is there of human feeling trying to fit into a social form. Transgression just doesn't mean very much to me, because I don't think that there's this category of thing that is forbidden, and if you do it, you've transgressed. It's uh, I'm, I, Maybe in some circumstances or contexts I could think that way, but I don't generally. Mary Gateskill, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you very much. Mary Gateskill's new collection of essays is called Somebody with a Little Hammer. After we take a short break, we'll hear from Julia Tertian, whose new cookbook is for people who want some help with home cooking. This is Fresh Air. Here's another NPR podcast you might like, Latino USA. Host Maria Inojosa brings you interviews and stories in which you'll hear from artists and immigrants, abuelos, and others who are changing the American political, social, and creative landscape. You can find Latino USA on the NPR One app and wherever you get your podcasts. Do you get stressed out looking in your refrigerator trying to figure out what to make for dinner? Do you want to know how to cook a perfect fried egg easily? Our next guest cookbook might be what you need. 
Julia Tertian wrote her cookbook to help take some of the stress out of home cooking. It's called Small Victories, Recipes, Advice, and Hundreds of Ideas for Home Cooking Triumphs. Tertian says, if you know how to make two things in the kitchen, then you have the skills to make 200 more. Small Victories is Tertian's first solo cookbook, but she's co-authored several bestsellers, including Gwyneth Paltrow's It's All Good and Mario Batali's Spain, A Culinary Road Trip. She's also been a personal chef. She spoke with Fresh Air producer Sam Brigger. Julia Tertian, welcome to Fresh Air. Thanks so much, Sam. I'm so excited to speak to you. So you say the goal of your cookbook, Small Victories, is to show that cooking doesn't have to be complicated to be satisfying. And part of that you do by using these small victories. So you, in, in each recipe, you include at least one small victory. So, so what is that concept? Sure. Yeah. So every recipe is introduced with a small victory. So to me, it's a tip or a technique that just makes cooking a little bit more approachable. And then what's super fun is every single recipe has a number of, I call them spinoffs, but they're they're variations. So the idea is once you know the tip or the technique, once you know the small victory, you can make this great thing, but you can also make so many other things. So it's really, you know, across the board, across the whole book, the goal is just to empower home cooks. Right. That's kind of neat. Like you have a recipe about fritters and I I can't remember what the prime recipe is, but one of them has chickpeas, but then the other, the spinoffs, you can do it with pinto beans or other kinds of beans. Or so you provide like four or five different kinds of recipes from that one base, which is neat. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's get to one of these small victories. One that I've been using a lot since reading the book is uh, the way to fry perfect eggs. Can you describe that method? Um, Yeah, this recipe is so interesting. I feel like it's become, I think, maybe the simplest recipe, but it's been really popular, which is great to see. And um, the recipe is for their olive oil fried eggs, which just means you fry them in olive oil and you serve them with yogurt, which isn't so commonly seen in America, but it's definitely very popular um, in other countries. So to the technique is to use a nonstick pan, first of all, because just why make things complicated? <laughs> Give yourself some insurance off the bat. Heat up a little bit of olive oil in the pan, crack the egg in, and then my little sort of secret trick is just to put a couple drops of water in the pan, and in the pan itself, not on the egg, and then cover the pan immediately. And what happens is that little tiny bit of water, like not even a teaspoon, just a few drops off you know, your fingertips, um, creates a little bit of steam and the lid will trap the steam in there. So you almost create this little sort of stovetop like steam oven. Mm. And what happens is your egg, you know, is cooking from underneath. It's got that nice hot pan. It's got that beautiful hot olive oil. But that steam on top will make sure that egg white on top is cooked through. But it's not an aggressive heat. You know, you're not flipping the egg over so you don't get an overcooked egg yolk. So what you end up with is just a really nicely fried egg where the egg white on top is completely cooked because I feel like I'll eat absolutely anything. I'll try anything. The one thing I really, really don't love is an uncooked or undercooked egg white. Yeah, so that's, that, that prevents gross. that. Yeah, yeah, and I'd say it, I say I do it now all the time. It works really well. You get a nice, nicely cooked egg white and a not too overcooked yolk, so it's great. I'm so glad to hear that's, <laughs> you know happening good. in your kitchen. That's yeah. awesome. So, what do you do with the yogurt? When do you add that into the dish? So, after you fry the egg, you mix just some plain yogurt, and you can use you know thick Greek yogurt, you know, or runnier kind of any kind of yogurt, just plain yogurt. And you mix it with um, just some lemon juice, a pinch of salt, and you kind of spread it on the plate. So you have mm. this layer of yogurt and you put your fried egg on top. And then basically as you eat it, as your you know fork pushes down through that egg, kind of scoops up some of that yogurt and it uh, creates this it's sort of a bed and a sauce all at once. Um, put a few fresh herbs on top. It's delicious. Mm. Well, in the spinoff section for hard-boiled eggs, you uh, suggest making deviled-ish eggs where you just <laughs> cut open a hard-boiled egg and just smear a little mayonnaise on top and maybe like a drop of hot sauce. How would you come up with that idea? It's so great because I feel like whenever I try to make a deviled egg, it just looks like a mess. <laughs> so many of my thoughts and decisions in the kitchen come from – You could either call it laziness or efficiency. (laughs) It's sort of your choice. But um, I love deviled eggs. I think they're delicious. But, you know, taking out all those egg yolks, making the mix, putting it back in. You know, it's a few steps that I think if you feel up for it and you want to, you know, it's worth it. And you can get a piping bag and really go crazy. But those same ingredients can just be layered on top of each other. It still tastes delicious. So it's essentially you're just, yeah, smearing a little mayonnaise on on a halved hard-boiled egg put a little hot sauce. You could dab a little mustard if you like that, whatever you like in your hard-boiled eggs, and you don't have to do all the work of 
dislodging the yolks and refilling them and everything. So I like those kinds of shortcuts where you still get a really wonderful result, but you know it's With a little like bit less time effort. and effort. Yeah. yeah, and I think anything like that, if it makes it easier for people to make something from scratch in their kitchen, I'm all for that. So although this is your first cookbook, um, you've co-authored many popular cookbooks, including ones with Mario Batali and Gwyneth Paltrow. And I was wondering if you could explain to us your role as a co-author in that situation. Like, does the other person come up with the ideas for dishes and then you're converting them into recipes? Is it more collaborative? Is it someone that says to you, like, go do something with chickpeas and come back to me in a week? Like, how does it work? <laughs> I would love that. I love chickpeas. <laughs> um, it is different every time. So yeah, Small Victories is my first book that's just just me on my own. But it's, I think it's, I should know this, I think it's the 10th book I've worked on. Yeah. So I've yeah. collaborated with lots of people. I've co-authored many books. And it's different every single time. It depends on the material that already exists. For example, I've worked on some restaurant cookbooks. Mm. And some of the restaurants I've worked with, um, you know, have binders full of recipes that it's my job to translate from like restaurant kind of vocabulary to home cooking, uh -huh. meaning they're often scaled to huge quantities. There's not many instructions because it's, you know, it's a chef writing uh, instructions for another chef. So it's, you know, a person speaking to another person who knows all these techniques. Um, so so there's like a language there already. Exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sometimes I think of myself as kind of like a, a home cooking translator. Huh. Like how, how can I translate this material so someone can do it successfully at home? And often it means kind of taking away a lot of excessive steps. And I've worked with um, restaurant chefs who nothing exists. Well, not nothing. <laughs> a lot of amazing things, but nothing written down. Well, you have a delicious-looking lasagna in the book, um, <laughs> and usually when you make lasagna, you either add ricotta to it or you make a like a white sauce, like a bechamel sauce as a filling, but you've come up with another method. What is that? Yeah, so um, it's kind of like the, the deviled-ish eggs where you can, can cut some steps out in order to get a really good result. Nonetheless, um, that is definitely what happened with this lasagna. So... I uh, took out the ricotta. I took out the bechamel. Um, the ricotta, because I love ricotta cheese, but um, I think when it's baked in a baked pasta, sometimes it can get a little stiff. And I love like a rich lasagna. So I, I tend to prefer a kind of bechamel lasagna. But the idea of making a bechamel sauce, which can um, put off some home cooks, especially people who are new to cooking. There's a lot of risk of things uh, not being smooth and all you're, that. Because you're kind of whisking flour into milk, right? Yeah. You're just doing you that. Make, yeah. You mix um, some flour and butter. You make essentially a roux, and then you slowly whisk in milk uh -huh. to make like a, a smooth, it's like a cream sauce. And then you can add cheese to it. You know, that's how you get things like macaroni and cheese, um, the base of uh, souffles, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, I just feel like it's not impossible to do by any means, but it's an extra step. It's an extra pot to clean. That's something that's always <laughs> yeah. on my mind. Um, but I was like, oh, I want that creamy layer, but I don't want to do that work. And so I went to one of my favorite ingredients, which is creme fraiche, which is basically like French sour cream. And you can actually just use sour cream if if that's all you can find. But creme fraiche is worth seeking out just because it's, it's richer. And why not add some more fat? <laughs> <laughs> Life is short. Um, so I make a super simple tomato sauce. It's uh, some garlic sizzled in olive oil. You throw in some canned tomatoes. And then I add creme fraiche directly to that because mm. instead of layering the lasagna, all the different sauces and you know, keeping track of what's on top of what, right. you know, it's all going to get mixed together anyway. So I just mix it. <laughs> and so you have this essentially creamy tomato sauce. And then I walk you through how to make homemade pasta, um, just because it's something I love doing. But you can absolutely make this recipe with uh, store-bought fresh pasta sheets. I've made it many times successfully with a box of those, um, like, no-cook lasagna noodles. Uh -huh. um, so basically, you just have your your noodles, your pasta layer. And the other step of lasagna that I find just to be so annoying <laughs> is pre-cooking those huge pasta sheets because, again, you're it's another pot to wash. Uh, you're having to maneuver these huge pieces of hot, slippery pasta. So instead of doing that and, you know, cooking them first, layering them with a sauce, I just make extra sauce. So the, um, the lasagna, you layer the raw pasta and all that delicious creamy tomato sauce, you throw it in the oven and all that kind of extra liquid from the sauce will cook the pasta through perfectly. Mm. And it's such a simple lasagna recipe as far as lasagna recipes go. Um, 
And it's just one of my favorites, and I love it. And you can add, you know, um, cooked ground sausage. You could start the sauce with some meat. You could add a layer of spinach, uh, roasted squash, you know, whatever you want. You can, you know, fill that however you like, but that's sort of the base of it, and it's, it's a really great recipe. We're listening to the interview Fresh Air producer Sam Brigger recorded with Julia Tertian, author of the new cookbook, Small Victories. We'll hear more of the interview after a break. This is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Home Advisor. At Home Advisor, it's fast and easy to find reliable pros for any kind of home project, from handyman services to remodeling the kitchen. Go to HomeAdvisor.com and tell them about your project. Home Advisor matches you with top rated local pros who have passed criminal and financial background checks. Read verified customer reviews, compare prices, and instantly book an appointment all online. Go to HomeAdvisor.com today or download the Home Advisor app for free. All right, well, here's another um, small victory from your book. Um, peeling ginger root is always very difficult because it's this really knobby, strange-looking root. And oftentimes when I have to, when I have to cook with it, you know, I cut 40% of the root away because it, you, it's hard to peel. So I'm usually like just cutting it. And so out of this weird round object, I get like this perfect rectangle, you know, mm-hmm. lose a lot. But so what, how do you recommend getting rid of the skin? Um, I recommend, and this is, yeah, something I've seen in lots of places, but um, yeah, just to use a spoon, like a normal, like a spoon you'd eat cereal with. And you just scrape the edge of the spoon on the ginger because the, the form of, of ginger root, you know, is totally kind of, you know, gnarly and goes in different directions. It's not a perfect rectangle um, by any means. And instead of fighting it, you kind of just need to go with it. And the skin itself is quite thin. So using just the edge of a spoon, which is, you know, firm enough to make some contact and make some difference, but Mm -hmm. it's not, it's not the blade of a knife. So you're not getting rid of too much. And you just scrape the ginger with a spoon and um, the skin comes off super easily and you're not taking off the ginger along with its skin. And I think it's one of those moments of just... um, not uh, not fighting something, hmm. just going with it. Yeah, I want to try that out. You call yourself a, a recipe developer, and so I just can you like lead us to the steps? Like, how do you actually develop a recipe? Do you do make that dish over and over again just to get it right, or how does? Sure, yeah. So when I do it on my own, it starts actually not so much in the kitchen, but on the page, hmm. and I write all of my recipes before I get into the kitchen, and then I kind of. I print them out and then I take my red pen (laughs) like a school teacher and then I start making the recipe. I start testing it. But that's usually when a lot of things will change because as I'm working on it, um, you know, I'll decide to change a spice or maybe something will get pan fried instead of roasted or vice versa, that kind of thing. But, yeah, I start on the page. So I I write it down first and it starts usually with... um, with a a thought or a memory, Hmm. um, something nostalgic, maybe something I had when I was a kid. But then, you know, there's a recipe in the book for a rice pilaf that's really delicious. And I love it. I mean, I love everything in the book. I'm biased. But (laughs) um, that recipe is basically my version of rice aroni, the rice in a box, um, which I ate all the time when I was a kid. And it was something I just loved. But the idea of that box of uh, of rice includes a lot of things you know you can't pronounce and um, it's quite salty and all that so I wanted a version of that so you know I'll usually start from a place like that like oh what's something that meant something to me are you more of an intuitive cook or do you like to go cook from recipes um, I feel like it's almost like my like dirty secret which is like I love writing recipes so mm-hmm. much and I never follow them <laughs> and um, when I when it comes to to just cooking, you know, on a average day at home, which I do every single day, you know, when I'm making dinner for me and my wife or, you know, friends come by or something, I never follow recipes. I'll look at cookbooks a lot before mm-hmm. just to uh, get inspired. I just like looking at them. Um, but I never, ever follow recipes. Every now and then I'll follow um, a recipe for a baked good, like if I'm making like a mm-hmm. cake or something. But Because those are pretty a, unforgiving, aren't they? Yeah. But if even if I'm making like a pie or something, I'm not following a recipe. Like huh. I, I've made pie crust enough to know the ratios. And once you make something a few times, you know, you get comfortable with it. And that's what I find so empowering about home cooking is you earn this set of skills that you can't lose. And then you can make all this stuff. And it's super cool. 
on the food website Grub Street, there's this feature that's called Grub Street Diet, and they ask someone to like keep a journal of their week and, and write it down what they ate or cooked uh, during that time. And you did one, I think it was like last year. And I found yours really fascinating. I mean, I understand that the article is supposed to show you know, your relationship to food over the week. So, of course, it's food-centric. But um, the way you described your day-to-day activities, and food just seems so infused into your life. And, um, and just the way you think about food, the way you prepare to shop or prepare to cook, um, it seemed deliberate and kind of mindful. It, it, almost, it almost felt like a, a spiritual practice. That's such a nice thing to say. Um, I think I think that's definitely accurate. It feels that way to me. It's um, I'm always thinking about food. I'm always thinking about you know. I'm one of those people who at breakfast I'm planning dinner. Um, Grace, my wife, is always getting annoyed at me because we're you know making sandwiches for lunch, and I'm always asking her you know what I should pick up <laughs> for the next meal, and she's like, can't, can't we just eat this one? <laughs> um, so it's definitely. Um, yeah, it occupies so much space in my, uh, you know, my mental space, my emotional space, and um, I've worked really hard to make it all as much as I can, like a really positive um, thing. If it's going to take up that much space, I want it to be mindful mm-hmm. um, and positive. And yeah, it definitely infuses kind of every decision I make. You know, I um, driving to the radio station today. The first thing I did was um, look up, you know, where I'm going to go grab something to eat afterwards, even though it's not a meal time. But if I'm going to go somewhere where I don't go all the time, I want to make sure I experience something good to eat. Where are you going? Um, well, it seems like uh, there's some good Vietnamese places around mm. here. So I was going to ask someone up front what they think. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd get a, when, I, when I'm somewhere I don't know, I ask other people <laughs> all the time. should always ask. Julia Tertian, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you so much for having me. Julia Tertian spoke with Fresh Air producer Sam Brigger. Her new cookbook is called Small Victories. Tomorrow on Fresh Air... Dear Dick, this is about obsession. My guest will be Jill Soloway, the creator of the Amazon series Transparent and the new Amazon series I Love Dick, about a feminist filmmaker attracted to a macho artist named Dick. We'll talk about the new series and about gender and identity and why Soloway now considers herself non-binary. I hope you'll join us. Fresh Air's executive producer is Danny Miller. Our interviews and reviews are produced and edited by Amy Sallett, Phyllis Myers, Anne-Marie Boldonado, Sam Brigger, Lauren Krenzel, Heidi Simon, Teresa Madden, Muj Zaidi, and Thea Chaloner. I'm Terry Gross. This is fresh air. 
Support for this podcast and the following message come from Home Advisor. At Home Advisor, it's fast and easy to find reliable pros for any kind of home project, from handyman services to remodeling the kitchen. Go to homeadvisor.com and tell them about your project. Home Advisor matches you with top-rated local pros who have passed criminal and financial background checks. Read verified customer reviews, compare prices, and instantly book an appointment all online. Go to homeadvisor.com today or download the Home Advisor app for free. All right, well, here's another um, small victory from your book. Um, peeling ginger root is always very difficult because it's this really knobby, strange looking root. And oftentimes when I have to when I have to cook with it, you know, I cut forty percent of the root away because it you, it's hard to peel. So I'm usually like just cutting it. And so out of this weird round object, I get like this perfect rectangle, you know, mm-hmm. lose a lot. But so what, how do you recommend getting rid of the skin? Um, I recommend, and this is, yeah, something I've seen in lots of places, but um, yeah, just to use a spoon, like a normal, like a spoon you'd eat cereal with. And you just scrape the edge of the spoon on the ginger because the, the form of, of ginger root, you know, is totally kind of, you know, gnarly and goes in different directions. It's not a perfect rectangle um, by any means. And instead of fighting it, you kind of just need to go with it. And the skin itself is quite thin. So using just the edge of a spoon, which is, you know, firm enough to make some contact and make some difference, Mm -hmm. but it's not it's not the blade of a knife. So you're not getting rid of too much. And you just scrape the ginger with a spoon and um, the skin comes off super easily and you're not taking off the ginger along with its skin. And I think it's one of those moments of just... um, not uh, not fighting something, hmm. just going with it. Yeah, I want to try that out. You call yourself a, a recipe developer, and so I just can you like lead us to the steps? Like, how do you actually develop a recipe? Do you do you make that dish over and over again just to get it right, or how does? Sure, yeah. So when I do it on my own, it starts actually not so much in the kitchen, but on the page, hmm. and I write all of my recipes before I get into the kitchen, and then I kind of. I print them out and then I take my red pen <laughs> like a school teacher and then I start making the recipe. I start testing it. But that's usually when a lot of things will change because as I'm working on it, um, you know, I'll decide to change a spice or maybe something will get pan fried instead of roasted or vice versa, that kind of thing. But, yeah, I start on the page. So I, I write it down first and it starts usually with um, – with a, a thought or a memory, hmm. um, something nostalgic, maybe something I had when I was a kid. But then, you know, there's a recipe in the book for a rice pilaf. That I've had a long-term relationship with two children who they hosted through the Fresh Air Fund. Those children are now young adults. Did they read the book, uh, your novel, The Mayor? Well, I, I don't know. Um, I, I gave it to um, them. I, I, I saw that I met them for Thanksgiving after it came out. And... Um, I handed it to them, and I, I said, I think you might find this really weird, and you might find it boring, actually, because it's pretty slow-paced. And she looked at it. She opened it, read the first page and a half, looked at me very seriously and said, this isn't boring, Mary, and then closed it and said, I think I'm going to read it later. And I didn't hear from her for quite a while. So I texted her and said, asked her how she was, and she said, okay. And I said, did you read the book? Because I thought she might have been angry or something. I wouldn't, I don't know why she would be, but people can react, you know, all kinds of ways. And she said she started to, and she had too many feelings. And so she stopped. And I understood that. Because I actually, I said that to her when I first gave it to her. I think you might have a lot of feelings. Um... I hope she reads it eventually, and I'd like to talk about it with her. Um, it's, it's not really about her, like I said, but, I mean, the girl in the story is pretty different from her, and the things that happen in the story are quite different. I wrote it partly for her, though, because she was somebody who um, really loved uplifting movies and stories, and... I, I, it's interesting because as a writer, I've never been somebody who believed that you should had any obligation to write uplifting movies and stories of storylines for people to make people feel good. It just, I was just never about that. 
Not that I wanted people to feel bad either, but I just thought writing with that kind of agenda was a mistake. But it's really different when you're writing for young people, and I I could really feel her. Like if we watched a movie together, um, which was a a lot, um, I could feel her really respond if there was a Latina character on the screen. And that didn't happen often enough. And it's not something normally I was very tuned into, but I became very tuned into it. And I remember during 2007, when I was still pretty involved with them, I saw a little film clip of National Velvet, and I thought, I wish there could be a movie like this about a Latina girl, but I can't write a movie. And I tried to sell it to my agent as a treatment, thinking somebody else could write it as a movie. And he said, no, if you want to do this, you've got to write a young adult novel. And I thought, well, that's impossible. (laughs) <laughs> uh, then, really, I just thought that that's impossible, and especially how can I write f- and crack the egg in? And then my little sort of secret trick is just to put a couple drops of water in the pan and in the pan itself, not on the egg, and then cover the pan immediately. And what happens is that little tiny bit of water, like not even a teaspoon, just a few drops off, you know, your fingertips. Um, creates a little bit of steam and the lid will trap the steam in there. So you almost create this little sort of stovetop like steam oven. Mm. And what happens is your egg, you know, is cooking from underneath. It's got that nice hot pan. It's got that beautiful hot olive oil. But that steam on top will make sure that egg white on top is cooked through. But it's not an aggressive heat. You know, you're not flipping the egg over so you don't get an overcooked egg yolk. So what you end up with is just a really nicely fried egg where the egg white on top is completely cooked because I feel like I'll eat absolutely anything. I'll try anything. The one thing I really, really don't love is an uncooked or undercooked egg white. Yeah, so that's, that, <laughs> that prevents gross. that. Yeah, yeah, and I'd say I'd, I'd, I do it now all the time. It works really well. You get a nice, nicely cooked egg white and a not too overcooked yolk, so it's great. I'm so glad to hear that's, <laughs> that's you know, happening in your kitchen. That's <laughs> yeah. awesome. So what do you do with the yogurt? When do you add that into the dish? So after you fry the egg, you mix just some plain yogurt, and you can use, you know, thick Greek yogurt, you know, or runnier kind of, any kind of yogurt, just plain yogurt, and you mix it with um, just some lemon juice, a pinch of salt, and you kind of spread it on the plate. So you have Mm. this layer of yogurt, and you put your fried egg on top, and then basically as you eat it, as your, you know, fork pushes down through that egg, kind of scoops up some of that yogurt, and it uh, creates this, it's sort of a bed and a sauce all at once. Um, Put a few fresh herbs on top. It's delicious. Mm. Well, in the spinoff section for hard-boiled eggs, you uh, suggest making deviled-ish eggs where you just (laughs) cut open a hard-boiled egg and just smear a little mayonnaise on top and maybe like a drop of hot sauce. How would you come up with that idea? It's so great because I feel like whenever I try to make a deviled egg, it just looks like a mess. (laughs) So many of my thoughts and decisions in the kitchen come from... You could either call it laziness or efficiency. (laughs) It's sort of your choice. But um, I love deviled eggs. I think they're delicious. But, you know, taking out all those egg yolks, making the mix, putting it back in. You know, it's a few steps that I think if you feel up for it and you want to, they're, you know, it's worth it. And you can get a piping bag and really go crazy. But those same ingredients can just be layered on top of each other. It still tastes delicious. So it's essentially you're just, yeah, smearing a little mayonnaise on on a halved hard-boiled egg put a little hot sauce. You could dab a little mustard if you like that, whatever you like in your hard-boiled eggs. And you don't have to do all the work of dislodging the yolks and refilling them and everything. So I like those kinds of shortcuts where you still get a really wonderful result, but, you know, it's a little bit less time and effort. Yeah. Yeah. And I think anything like that, if it makes it easier for people to make something from scratch in their kitchen, I'm all for that. So although this is your first cookbook... um, Um. It's not really about her, like I said, but, I mean, the girl in the story is pretty different from her, and the things that happen in the story are quite different. I wrote it partly for her, though, because she was somebody who um, really loved uplifting movies and stories. And I, I, it's interesting, because as a writer, I've never been somebody who believed that you should had any obligation to write uplifting movies and stories of Mary storylines for people to make people feel good. It just, I was just never about that. Not that I wanted people to feel bad either, but I just thought writing with that kind of agenda was a mistake. But it's really different when you're writing for young people, and I I could really feel her. Like if we watched a movie together, um, which was a a lot, um, I could feel her really respond if there was a Latina character on the screen. 
And I, there, that didn't happen often enough. And it's not something normally I was very tuned into, but I became very tuned into it. And I remember during like, 2007, when I was still pretty involved with them, I saw a little film clip of National Velvet, and I thought, oh, I wish there could be a movie like this about a Latina girl, but I can't write a movie. And I tried to sell it to my agent as a treatment, thinking somebody else could write it as a movie. And he said, oh, if you want to do this, you've got to write a young adult novel. And I thought, well, that's impossible. <laughs> uh, then, really, I just thought, that that's impossible. And especially, how can I write from the point of view of a Latina girl? It's ridiculous. I can't do that. Plus, I know nothing about horses. But I couldn't let go of the idea. It kept coming back to me in a way that I've just never experienced before. Like, lines of dialogue would pop into my head. Um, scenes would I'd be sitting at an airport being angry because I'd missed my flight or the flight was delayed or something. And a whole scene would unscroll from this story that I hadn't even committed to writing. I, I was still thinking, I can't write this. So that's really never happened to me before, and I finally decided to do it. You, you've said that after your first collection of short stories, Bad Behavior, was published, that people expected you to embody hipness, <laughs> but, but that you didn't. And people expected that in part because, you know, these are like transgressive stories, and there were stories about people who had, you know, what would be considered kind of kinky relationships, BDS and M. Um, so uh, what's the image of you now, do you think? What do people expect to meet when they meet you? I really don't know. But it, it it's interesting because, and you're talking about that, I do know, like, um, the the review I got of um, the book of essays in the Times, which was a very, very nice review, but it was written by uh, the same guy, Dwight Garner, who... Reason and sanity of piercing intelligence and generous humanity. Gayscale's 2005 novel, Veronica, was on our book critic Maureen Corrigan's list of her favorite books of that year and was nominated for a National Book Award. Maureen described Gateskill's 2015 novel, The Mare, as a raw, beautiful story about love and mutual delusion. I spoke with Gateskill about her new collection, Somebody with a Little Hammer. In one of her essays, she writes about working as a stripper when she was just starting out on her own. Mary Gateskill, welcome back to Fresh Air. You write that you were a PC feminist before PC <laughs> was even named. Um, so what was it like for you as a feminist to be stripping and to have so many men lustfully gazing at you? Did you find it to be like affirming, an ego booster? Was it threatening? Was it demeaning? Did it make you feel more valuable or less valuable? You know what I mean? Like, what, how, I know you were doing it because you needed to make a living, but when you were on stage or whatever, like what, what was it like for you? Well, I... Uh that that was kind of you know, was a stage the then. wrong word <laughs> no it was actually a stage okay good um but where, where the places that i was working were actually old school strip clubs they were not um i i did work sometimes in bars but the main places i worked were actually a kind of a cross between um like they did there was one place that actually had a band still it's like a burlesque um, era. <laughs> You're just it, well, it was. Yeah, it, it was transitioning from the burlesque era to the topless go-go bar era. Uh huh. Like there were women who still like had boas and um, did a very old school strip act. It was not uh, you, you like customers weren't allowed to touch you. There wasn't. There's was very little tipping. They couldn't touch you. They couldn't like stick money in your underpants or anything like that. But but it, I was very young. I was like 21, and um, I, I wouldn't say at that point I was a, a PC feminist, but I was kind of getting there. I was thinking about things in a different way. But at that time, I mean, it perhaps sounds strange to you, but it, I know it wouldn't sound strange to other to some people now. Uh, I didn't see a contradiction. Um, to me, I, I felt like this was something that I could do for my own benefit, and I didn't feel like it was degrading, although I, I, I could see how it could become that way. I, I saw the women who'd been doing it for a really long time, and it, they, it did define them. I could see if you did this for a very long time, it could define you regardless of what you thought your politics were or what you thought you were in control of, and I was cautious about that. But for me to do it for, I did it for two years, didn't feel 
Um, creates this it's sort of a bed and a sauce all at once. Um, put a few fresh herbs on top. It's delicious. Mm. Well, in the spinoff section for hard-boiled eggs, you uh, suggest making deviled-ish eggs where you just <laughs> cut open a hard-boiled egg and just smear a little mayonnaise on top and maybe like a drop of hot sauce. How would you come up with that idea? It's so great because I feel like whenever I try to make a deviled egg, it just looks like a mess. <laughs> so many of my thoughts and decisions in the kitchen come from you could either call it laziness or efficiency. <laughs> it's sort of your choice. But um, I love deviled eggs. I think they're delicious. But, yeah. you know, taking out all those egg yolks, making the mix, putting it back in. You know, it's a few steps that I think if you feel up for it and you want to, they're, you know, it's worth it. And you can get a piping bag and really go crazy. But those same ingredients can just be layered on top of each other. It still tastes delicious. So it's essentially you're just, yeah, smearing a little mayonnaise on, on a halved hard-boiled egg put a little hot sauce. You could dab a little mustard if you like that, whatever you like in your hard-boiled eggs. And you don't have to do all the work of dislodging the yolks and refilling them and everything. So I like those kinds of shortcuts where you still get a really wonderful result, but, you know, it's a little bit less time and effort. Yeah. Yeah. And I think anything like that, if it makes it easier for people to make something from scratch in their kitchen, I'm all for that. So although this is your first cookbook, um, you've co-authored many popular cookbooks, including ones with Mario Batali and Gwyneth Paltrow. And I was wondering if you could explain to us your role as a co-author in that situation. Like, does the other person come up with the ideas for dishes and then you're converting them into recipes? Is it more collaborative? Is it someone that says to you, like, go do something with chickpeas and come back to me in a week? Like, how does (laughs) it work? I would love that. I love chickpeas. <laughs> um, it is different every time. So yeah, Small Victories is my first book. That's just just me on my own. But it's I think it's I should know this. I think it's the tenth book I've worked on. Yeah. So I've yeah. collaborated with lots of people. I've co-authored many books, and it's different every single time. It depends on the material that already exists. For example, I've worked on some restaurant cookbooks, mm. and some of the restaurants I've worked with, um, you know, have binders full. Of recipes that it's my job to translate from like restaurant kind of vocabulary to home cooking, uh-huh. meaning they're often scaled to huge quantities. There's not many instructions because it's, you know, it's a chef writing uh, instructions for another chef. So it's, you know, a person speaking to another person who knows all these techniques. Um, so so there's like a language there already. Exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sometimes I think of myself as kind of like a, a home cooking translator, uh-huh. like how how can I translate this material so someone can do it successfully at home? And often it means kind of taking away a lot of excessive steps. And I've worked with um, restaurant chefs who nothing exists, or well, not nothing, <laughs> a lot of amazing things, but nothing written down. Well, you have a delicious-looking lasagna in the book. Um, and <laughs> a station today, the first thing I did was um, look up, you know, where I'm going to go grab something to eat afterwards, even though it's not a meal time. But if I'm going to go somewhere where I don't go all the time, I want to make sure I experience something good to eat. Where are you going? Um, well, it seems like uh, there's some good Vietnamese places around mm. here. So I was going to ask someone up front what they think. <laughs> Yeah, I I'd, I'd get a when I when I'm somewhere I don't know, I ask other people all the time. Should always ask. Julia Tertian, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you so much for having me. Julia Tertian spoke with Fresh Air producer Sam Brigger. Her new cookbook is called Small Victories. Tomorrow on Fresh Air, Dear Dick, this is about obsession. My guest will be Jill Soloway, the creator of the Amazon series Transparent and the new Amazon series I Love Dick, about a feminist filmmaker attracted to a macho artist named Dick. We'll talk about the new series and about gender and identity and why Soloway now considers herself non-binary. I hope you'll join us. Fresh Air's executive producer is Danny Miller. Our interviews and reviews are produced and edited by Amy Sallett, Phyllis Myers, Anne-Marie Boldonado, Sam Brigger, Lauren Krenzel, Heidi Simon, Teresa Madden, Muj Zaidi, and Thea Chaloner. I'm Terry Gross.
working as a stripper when she was just starting out on her own, and running away from home. I ran away from home the first time at 15. And if I was a parent, I would definitely not want my 15-year-old daughter running away out in the world. I mean, nobody would. Also, we hear from Julia Tertian. She'll talk about her new cookbook, Small Victories. It's for people who are insecure about their cooking. I think of recipes as they're kind of sold to people as prescriptions, like Mm. these really uh, precise things, but there's so much more flexibility in cooking. There's very rarely like a wrong answer. That's coming up on Fresh Air. Thanks for listening to Fresh Air. I want to let you know about a new morning news podcast from NPR called Up First. Its purpose is to give you a sense of the big stories and issues of the day and to do it in just 10 minutes. You can hear it weekday mornings by 6 a.m. Eastern on the NPR One app and wherever you get your podcasts. My guest Mary Gateskill first became known for her 1988 collection of short stories, Bad Behavior, about people whose relationships and sexual relationships were outside of what was defined as normal. One of those stories was adapted into the movie Secretary with Maggie Gyllenhaal and James Spader. In Gateskill's new collection of essays, dating from 1994 to 2016, Gateskill writes, In case you don't know, I'm supposedly sick and dark. But as Soraya Dorbin recently wrote in the L.A. Review of Books, it should be obvious that she is neither one nor the other, that she is, in fact, a voice of reason and sanity, of piercing intelligence and generous humanity. Gayscale's 2005 novel, Veronica, was on our book critic Maureen Corrigan's list of her favorite books of that year and was nominated for a National Book Award. Maureen described Gayscale's 2015 novel, The Mare, as a raw, beautiful story about love and mutual delusion. I spoke with Gayscale about her new collection, Somebody with a Little Hammer. In one of her essays, she writes about working as a stripper when she was just starting out on her own. Mary Gatesgill, welcome back to Fresh Air. You write that you were a PC feminist before PC (laughs) was even named. Uh, So what was it like for you as a feminist to be stripping and to have so many men lustfully gazing at you? Did you find it to be like affirming, an ego booster? Was it threatening? Was it demeaning? Did it make you feel more valuable or less valuable? You know what I mean? Like what, how, I know you were doing it because you needed to make a living, but when you were on stage or whatever, like what, what was it like for you? Well, I, uh, that, that was kind of, you know, is stage the wrong word? (laughs) No, it was actually a stage. Okay, good. Um, but were, were the places that are looking at them, um, but I never, ever follow recipes. Every now and then I'll follow, um, a recipe for a baked good, like if I'm making like a mm-hmm. cake or something. But because those are pretty a, unforgiving, aren't they? Yeah, but if even if I'm making like a pie or something, I'm not following a recipe. Like huh. I, I've made pie crust enough to know the ratios. And once you make something a few times, you know, you get comfortable with it. And that's what I find so empowering about home cooking is you earn this set of skills that you can't lose, and then you can make all this stuff, and it's super cool. On the food website Grub Street, there's this feature. It's called Grub Street Diet, and they ask someone to like keep a journal of their week and, and write it down what they ate or cooked uh, during that time. And you did one, I think it was like last year. And I found yours really fascinating. I mean, I understand that the article is supposed to show, you know, your relationship to food over the week. So, of course, it's food-centric. But um, the way you described your day-to-day activities, and food just seems so infused into your life. And... Um, and just the way you think about food, the way you prepare to shop or prepare to cook, um, it seemed deliberate and kind of mindful. It, it almost it almost felt like a, a spiritual practice. That's such a nice thing to say. Um, I think I think that's definitely accurate. It feels that way to me. It's um, I'm always thinking about food. I'm always thinking about you know. I'm one of those people who at breakfast I'm planning dinner. Um, Grace, my wife, is always getting annoyed at me because we're, you know, making sandwiches for lunch, and I'm always asking her, you know, what I should pick up <laughs> for the next meal, and she's like, "Can't, can't we just eat this one?" <laughs> um, so it's definitely, um, yeah, it occupies so much space in my, uh, you know, my mental space, my emotional space, and um, I've worked 
really hard to make it all as much as I can, like a really positive um, thing. If it's going to take up that much space, I want it to be mindful Mm -hmm. um, and positive. And yeah, it definitely infuses kind of every decision I make. You know, I am driving to the radio station today. The first thing I did was um, look up, you know, where I'm going to go grab something to eat afterwards, even though it's not a meal time. But if I'm going to go somewhere where I don't go all the time, I want to make sure I experience something good to eat. Where are you going? Um, Well, it seems like uh, there's some good Vietnamese places around Mm. here. So I was going to ask someone up front what they think. (laughs) Yeah, I'd I'd get a lot. When when I'm somewhere I don't know, I ask other people (laughs) all the time. should always ask. Julia Tertian, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you so much for having me. Julia Tertian spoke with Fresh Air producer Sam Brigger. Her new cookbook is called Small Victories. Tomorrow on Fresh Air... Dear Dick, this is about obsession. My guest will be Jill Soloway, the creator of the Amazon series Transparent and the new Amazon series. Not uh, not fighting something, hmm. just going with it, yeah. I want to try that out. You call yourself a, a recipe developer, and so I just can you like lead us to the steps? Like, how do you actually develop a recipe? Do you do make that dish over and over again just to get it right, or how does? Sure, yeah. So when I do it on my own, it starts actually not so much in the kitchen, but on the page, hmm. and I write all of my recipes before I get into the kitchen, and then I kind of. I print them out and then I take my red pen (laughs) like a school teacher and then I start making the recipe. I start testing it. But that's usually when a lot of things will change because as I'm working on it, um, you know, I'll decide to change a spice or maybe something will get pan fried instead of roasted or vice versa, that kind of thing. But, yeah, I start on the page. So I I write it down first and it starts usually with... um, with a, a thought or a memory, hmm. um, something nostalgic, maybe something I had when I was a kid. But then, you know, there's a recipe in the book for a rice pilaf that's really delicious, and I love it. I mean, I love everything in the book. I'm biased. But <laughs> um, that recipe is basically my version of rice aroni, the rice in a box, um, yeah. which I ate all the time when I was a kid. And it was something I just loved. But the idea of that box of uh, of rice includes a lot of things you know you can't pronounce and um, it's quite salty and all that so I wanted a version of that so you know I'll usually start from a place like that like oh what's something that meant something to me are you more of an intuitive cook or do you like to go cook from recipes um, I feel like it's almost like my like dirty secret which is like I love writing recipes so mm. much and I never follow them <laughs> and, um, when I when it comes to to just cooking, you know, on a average day at home, which I do every single day, you know, when I'm making dinner for me and my wife or, you know, friends come by or something, I never follow recipes. I'll look at cookbooks a lot before mm-hmm. just to uh, get inspired. I just like looking at them. Um, but I never, ever follow recipes. Every now and then I'll follow um a recipe for a baked good, like if I'm making like a mm-hmm. cake or something. But because those are pretty a, unforgiving, aren't they? Yeah, but if even if I'm making like a pie or something, I'm not following a recipe. Like huh. I, I've made pie crust enough to know the ratios. And once you make something a few times, you know you get comfortable with it. And that's what I find so empowering about home cooking is you earn this set of skills that you can't lose, and then you can make all this stuff, and it's super cool. On the food website Grub Street, there's this feature. It's called Grub Street Diet, and they ask someone to like keep a journal of their week and, and write it down what they ate or cooked uh, during that time. And you did one, I think it was like last year. And I found yours really fascinating. I mean, I understand that the article is supposed to show, you know, your relationship to food over the week. So, of course, it's food-centric. But um, the way you described your day-to-day activities – and Parent, I would definitely not want my 15-year-old daughter running away out in the world. I mean, nobody would. Also, we hear from Julia Tertian. She'll talk about her new cookbook, Small Victories. It's for people who are insecure about their cooking. I think of recipes as they're kind of sold to people as prescriptions, like Mm. these really uh, precise things. But there's so much more flexibility in cooking. There's very rarely like a wrong answer. That's coming up on Fresh Air. Thanks for listening to Fresh Air. I want to let you know about a new morning news podcast from NPR called Up First. Its purpose is to give you a sense of the big stories and issues of the day and to do it in just 10 minutes. You can hear it weekday mornings by 6 a.m. Eastern on the NPR One app and wherever you get your podcasts. 
My guest Mary Gatesgill first became known for her 1988 collection of short stories, Bad Behavior, about people whose relationships and sexual relationships were outside of what was defined as normal. One of those stories was adapted into the movie Secretary with Maggie Gyllenhaal and James Spader. In Gatesgill's new collection of essays, dating from 1994 to 2016, Gatesgill writes, In case you don't know, I'm supposedly sick and dark. But as Soraya Dorbin recently wrote in the L.A. Review of Books, it should be obvious that she is neither one nor the other, that she is, in fact, a voice of reason and sanity, of piercing intelligence and generous humanity. Gayscale's 2005 novel, Veronica, was on our book critic Maureen Corrigan's list of her favorite books of that year and was nominated for a National Book Award. Maureen described Gatesgill's 2015 novel, The Mare, as a raw, beautiful story about love and mutual delusion. I spoke with Gatesgill about her new collection, Somebody with a Little Hammer. In one of her essays, she writes about working as a stripper when she was just starting out on her own. Mary Gatesgill, welcome back to Fresh Air. You write that you were a PC feminist before PC (laughs) was even named. Um, So what was it like for you as a feminist to be stripping and to have so many men lustfully gazing at you? Did you find it to be like affirming, an ego booster? Was it threatening? Was it demeaning? Did it make you feel more valuable or less valuable? You know what I mean? Like, what, how? I know you were doing it because you needed to make a living, but when you were on stage or whatever, like, what, what was it like for you? Well, I, uh, that that was kind of you know, was a stage the them. wrong word <laughs> no it was actually a stage okay good um but where, where the places that i was working were actually old school strip clubs they were not um i i did work sometimes in bars but the main places i worked were 